Our topic tonight is the international interventions in troubled states, the Somalian experience. Countries, including the United States, whether acting alone, such as in the case of Haiti, or under the umbrella of the United Nations, such as in the case of the former Yugoslavia, have intervened in troubled states for one reason or another. Have these interventions accomplished their missions? To answer that question, using, using the Somalian experience, an experience that we are all familiar with, we have with us tonight His Excellency Ambassador Abdul Rahim Abi Farah. <coughs> Born and educated in the UK, he served in the British Somaliland government from 1936 until 1960. On independence, Mr. Abi Farah became his country's first ambassador to Ethiopia and then to the United Nations. In that capacity, he represented Somalia on the Security Council, served and chaired several United Nations standing committees and represented Somalia on numerous occasions at conferences of the non-aligned countries and the Organization of African Union. In 1972, Ambassador Farah, Abi Farah was, was seconded to the United Nations and served first as Commissioner for Technical Cooperation and later as Under Secretary General for Special Political Questions with Special Responsibilities for Africa. In 1990, he retired from the United Nations Secretariat after 18 years of distinguished service. Ambassador Pizzello, who is also with us here tonight, was talking to Ambassador Abi Farah before the session, and he asked him whether he retired or he's still active. And the ambassador answered, I will retire when my heart stops. In 1991, Ambassador Abi Farah was appointed as a special envoy of the, of the Secretary General for missions to Kuwait and Iran. In 1992, he joined Dr. Kevin Cahill of New York in establishing the Center for International Health and Cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Abi Farah to the Council. remarkable number of documents here, which I found always a useful ploy uh, when you speak to uh, an audience which is above your intellectual level and you know you can't convince them, the best thing you do is to intimidate them. And so this paper that I have is really, it's, it's, it's a question of intimidation. Uh, when I was uh, last in, some, in uh, Somaliland, I met a gentleman from Baltimore and uh, he asked me whether I had ever been to his hometown. I said, no. He said, when you do go, please go down to the harbor and have some crab cakes. So <laughs> this is my first visit to Baltimore, and I hope tomorrow, tomorrow to, to uh, serve one of your famous crab cakes. Uh, first of all, let me thank Mr. Shemali for his uh, introduction. Um, I, I really started my service with the Somaliland government, not 1936, but 1938, so please don't make me older than I am. <laughs> but I have, I have, I've uh, had the good fortune of having a wide uh, number of uh, interesting assignments while I was with the Somaliland Somali, Somali government, first in the district administration, so I know a lot about uh, the country, followed by a long stint with the information department. So on the question of communications, I'm quite conversant. And that's maybe it's because it was a marriage of those two experiences that the government uh, decided I should might do well in the field of diplomacy. I was, uh, and having been in the United Nations, 
I suddenly realized what a most interesting job it was and uh, how it has served me well. Um, I put on a lot of weight. I, I, I drank as much as anyone could drink and I kept my sanity. But when I was approached by uh, by the Catholic Research Services uh, President and Director, Ken Hackett. No, it's, it's on. Uh, you're just going to have to be closer to it. Very well. Uh, I was uh, asked uh, what, what subject I would like to discuss. Like I said, I've been in, uh, in, in diplomacy for so long, it's only since the last year or two that I've been involved in what we call humanitarian operations, and I hope maybe I'll have the opportunity of saying something about the suffering and the problems, the social and economic problems that beset our devastated country. And then I was, I was eventually prevailed upon to widen the, my, the subject of my discourse and to say international intervention in troubled states, using the Somali experience as an example. Now, as the United Nations uh, finds uh, itself increasingly involved in international humanitarian intervention in the post-Cold War period, it is faced with a number of problems inherent in such situations. The intervention in Somalia should constitute a valuable learning experience if the UN can examine objectively the failures and accomplishments of the Somali operation. Accomplishments there were, failures there were. In Somalia, the, the UN was called on to deal with a situation of almost unprecedented chaos and anarchy. The civil war that was fought between various liberation movements and the Siadbari regime, followed by bitter inter-clan fighting, compounded by the criminal and brutal behavior of armed and marauding bands against innocent and defenseless civilians throughout many of the southern provinces of the country. And finally, war-induced famine. All this combined to create a situation which a former director of the US Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance described at the time as, quote, the worst humanitarian disaster in the world today. The unconscionable delay by the international community in responding to the desperate plight of the population compelled the Secretary General's envoy in Somalia in 1991 to exclaim that, quote, a whole year slipped by whilst the United Nations and the international community, save for the International Committee of the Red Cross and a handful of non-governmental organizations, watched Somalia descend into this hell, unquote. The human cost of this situation was appalling. More than one million Somalis fled their homes and sought asylum in neighboring countries and elsewhere. About two million were internally displaced without the means to earn a livelihood. More than 300,000 were killed or died from malnutrition and disease as a direct result of the crisis. Countless numbers suffered physical and mental wounds which would take considerable time to heal. And in a great number of cases, many will be physically disabled and mentally crippled for life. What made the Somali situation so unusual, of course, was that the frameworks of government and of civilian enterprise were completely shattered. There was no central government, no state institutions, such as police, courts of law, army, schools or hospitals. There was no recognized authority with which the international community could negotiate. There were no public records, no safe drinking water systems, no public electricity supplies, no public health 
and sanitation arrangements, no radio and television services, no banks and no revenues. That was the situation in 1991. It's, it is practically the same situation today. It is interesting, I think you'd find it interesting to diver if I diverged for a moment to examine what brought about the situation. In the first place, let me make it very clear, the Somalis must bear the largest share of the blame. For it was their leaders who devised the policies which brought the country to ruin. I feel sad in having to say this, being a Somali myself, but unless we recognize our own shortcomings, admit them, and do something about them, we will we'll never go forward. Tragically, these leaders were helped in the process by the financial, material, and particularly the military support given to them by a number of countries and by the somewhat indifferent attitude to the purpose for which that support was being used. The Siadbari regime, which is the regime which was in power from 1969 through a military coup d'etat and which, and which ended in, in January 1991, came to power, as I said, in 1969. As soon as, he, as, soon as, he, as the regime came to power, it declared the country a socialist state and entered into a friendship pact with the Soviet Union. Somalis had no notion of socialism. It was purely a gimmick on the part of, of the leader, simply to acquire arms by which he could, he could consolidate his illegal acquisition of power. That pact enabled Somalia to acquire an arsenal of arms far beyond its defensive needs and resulted in Somalia building up one of Africa's largest armies. With the shifting sands of Cold War politics, Somalia changed sides and crossed over to, to the United States. The reason was not a change of heart against socialism or a love for Western-style democracy. It was simply a means of securing the survival of the regime and the continued flow of arms by which it could keep that regime in power. It is these huge quantities of arms that were supplied to Somalia by the Soviet Union, later by the United States and, uh, and, and other countries in, in Europe and in the Arab world, that has that, that, that has been the cause and the, um, that, precip that precipitated the problems that, that now face the Somali people. They transformed Somalia's relatively peaceful countryside into Africa's killing fields. These arms were used to subdue opposition to the regime. Beginning first, beginning the deliberate policy of eliminating any group or institution that could pose a threat to the regime. It began first with the removal or imprisonment of the country's top political leaders, followed by the retirement or dismissal of experienced civil, civil servants. Then the removal or margining of tribal and religious leaders. And finally, neutralizing the political potential of, tra of traders and businessmen by nationalizing the import and export trade and making those traders, those businessmen, all subservient to the whims and fancies of the regime for trade licenses. Where unrest manifested itself, reprisal attacks followed. Typical was the air and land bombardment 
in 1988 of Hargeisa, the, the, the former capital of British Somaliland Land and the second largest city in, 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 the, in the Republic, with a population of over 400,000. The city was leveled, over 25,000 people were killed, and the rest were compelled to flee for safety. The, the majority seeking asylum in nearby Ethiopia, and others the shelter of their relatives in the area. No single state publicly protested the slaughter, and the few that did level criticism did so mutely. Had the protest been strong enough then, perhaps Somalia would have been spared the agony it experienced. The question of whether the United Nations had the mechanisms or mandate to, pre to prevent such a situation from developing is crucial for the approach to related or similar situations in future. In the political and security field, the United Nations Charter addresses itself primarily to the maintenance of international peace and security, and to that end, to take effective collective measures for the prevention and removal of threats to the peace and for the suppression of acts of aggression or other breaches of the peace. But such measures recognize the sovereign equality of all its members and are directed towards regulating among states and requiring that they settle their internal disputes by peaceful means. The Charter was careful not to be seen as intruding in matters of domestic jurisdiction. For this reason, Article 2.7 of the Charter made clear that, and I quote, Noth nothing contained in the present charter shall authorize the United Nations to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state, or shall require the members to submit such matters to settlement under the present charter. But this principle shall not prejudice the application of enforcement measures under Chapter 7. So one can see that in in, uh, regulating relations between states was admissible, but interfering in the, in the internal affairs of any state by an outside party was inadmissible. It is because of, of Article 2.7 that many governments are able to ignore the provisions of the Declaration on Human Rights and other covenants aimed at protecting the civil and political rights of peoples everywhere. In general, states have been hesitant to lodge formal protest against other states within the pertinent organ of the United Nations. And when they did, they seldom found support. Of course, many governments live in glass houses and cannot afford to start throwing stones at others. Despite this anomalous situation, the Charter of the United Nations makes respect for human rights a legitimate international concern. The preamble to the Charter declares the United Nations determination, and I quote, to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women, and of nations large and small. Another article of the Charter, Article 55C, commits the United Nations to, and I quote, promoting universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms, end of quote. As one writer has observed, when these particular articles were being framed, there was no clearly defined philosophy of international action. It was not explained 
how an international agency whose members were sovereign states was going to, to be able to protect the rights of individuals dwelling within the boundaries of those same states without infringing Article 27. The inclusion of the Charter's, quote, humanitarian clauses can no doubt be attributed to the fact that by 1945, the world had become fully aware of the, outrage, of the outrages perpetrated against humanity by the Nazis and their allies. The Nuremberg prosecutions were an indication of the widespread demand for, for an authority which could go beyond national sovereignty and reasons of state and bring the perpetrators of such outrages to justice. Unfortunately, these humanitarian clauses were merely recommendatory and did not give the organization any powers of enforcement. For almost 50 years, the World Organization could not muster sufficient support within its membership to embark on any direct humanitarian interventions without the prior consent of the government concerned, even though large-scale human tragedies were taking place. The UN had to stand on the sidelines until the government of the state concerned where the outrages were being perpetrated agreed, consented, or invited the UN to, to come in and help out. Without that invitation, the UN was powerless. These tensions between domestic interference and the humanitarian clauses remain, but the close relationship between human rights, peace, and political stability, whether in the domestic or in the international domain, is apparent to the vast majority of states. Nevertheless, there are strong constraints on international humanitarian intervention. To some states, the ideal would be provision for unilateral humanitarian intervention by the United Nations in certain situations with or without the prior consent of the state concerned. We saw this during the Iraq war when NATO powers flew their planes into northern Iraq to take humanitarian supplies to besieged populations. They did so without re uh, requesting the, the, the uh, consent of the Iraqi government. And now, too, though, though, this, so this view is held by some states that, in other words, that it would be ideal if there was provision for unilateral humanitarian intervention by the United Nations to take place in certain situations with or without the prior consent of the state concerned. And to those states, in their, in their view, humanitarian aid is a human right and should be available to all in need. To other states, and this came out clearly during a debate in the UN General Assembly in 1991 on the subject of international intervention. Those states held that there must be scrupulous respect for the sovereignty of nations and for the principle of domestic jurisdiction. And they maintain that an essential attribute of that sovereignty is the principle of consent, which is one of the cornerstones of the democratic ideal itself. In that same debate in 1991 in the General Assembly, several states expressed the fear that unilateral international intervention, that is without or with the consent of the, state concern, of the government concerned, could be used as a platform for interfering in the, in the internal affairs of the country concerned. 
for those reasons, they suggested a delay in, in, the, in consideration of the proposal until the United Nations first defined the type of emergency situation it had in mind that would warrant international humanitarian intervention without the consent of the state concerned. Of course, I, those of you who are familiar with UN procedures you will, will recall that it took decades before the United Nations could agree on the definition of the term aggression at a time when its membership was less than 100. One can imagine how long it would take to define situations that would justify international humanitarian intervention with a membership of double that number. But with international intervention, the problem is to know when to intervene. There, in my view, there is a need for the establishment of norms of intervention. One possibility is that these be first drawn up by regional organizations so as to reflect the social and humanitarian norms of each region and then submit it to a universal body for final determination. Unfortunately, regional organizations, and by this I mean the, the League of Arab States, the Organization of African Unity, the Organization of American States, those, what, these are what we refer to as uh, regional organizations. These regional organizations have not exhibited much initiative in this respect, either because some of their member states and their member states would not meet recognized international norms, or because of political and other interests. There is also a need for clearly defined and effective international mechanisms which oppressed populations can call on for international humanitarian intervention. If there had been adequate monitoring and early warning and an early warning system in place in Somalia, it might have been possible for some form of international response to have been mounted before the situation got out of hand. But then this would presume that the government of the day, which was the Siad Bari regime, would have agreed to UN monitoring, to the UN monitoring of, this, of the country's internal situation, which he would have not. The question can be asked, can it be hoped that member states of the United Nations would support international monitoring mechanisms which would allow impartial and objective reporting on the human rights or disaster situation in each country. At present, this seems unlikely, in my view. The norms against which national performance can be measured are set out in a number of international covenants and, and agreements. <coughs> But these are seldom respected. Thirty years ago, a number of states proposed in the General Assembly that a High Commissioner for Human Rights be appointed to do this job. Sad to say, the proposal did not see daylight at the time and had to be put on the back burner. It was strongly opposed by a large vocal majority who interpreted the proposal as a ploy to enable certain states to interfere in their domestic affairs and to impose values and standards that conflicted with their way of life. Now that the question of humanitarian intervention has surfaced in many regions, Africa, the Balkan Peninsula, West Asia, the Caribbean, and parts of the former Soviet Union, 
and elsewhere, it offers some comfort to know that the General Assembly, two years ago, finally agreed to the appointment of High Commissioner for Human Rights, although it remains to be seen whether his mandate would allow him to have an impact on situations where human rights violations are alleged to be taking place. Recently, the High Commissioner visited Rwanda. Last week, he was in Havana. If he is given adequate authority and jurisdiction, his appointment will give assurance to populations all over the world that there are international remedies against arbitrary decisions by their governments that violate their human rights or deny them access to humanitarian assistance. Finally, it needs to be emphasized that mechanisms would only provide a first step. There would then, need, there would then be a need for the exercise of the international will to start and complete the process. It's all right having things on paper. The question is, can you get them into being? Can you give life to, to your decisions? Now, against this background of international law, it is interesting to consider how well the international community acquitted itself in its intervention in Somalia under the, um, under the mandate for UNISOM II approved by the Security Council. Uh, just, uh, may I just intervene? Do I have much time left? Okay. Of course, UNISOM II came after the purely humanitarian operation with a clearly circumscribed goal of emergency relief that had been launched and completed by the Bush administration. President Bush at that time, his administration, they went into the situation with clearly defined goals, and, and, and they knew when they, wanted, they gave the, when they wanted to withdraw. The mandate of UNISOM II, which followed after the end of that emergency, emergency relief operation by the Bush administration, in, in March 1993, and this is how, how the mandate read, the mandate of UNISOM II would confer authority for appropriate action, including enforcement action. Enforcement action involves combat. And if, and if combat is involved, it involves casualties. To establish throughout Somalia a secure environment for humanitarian assistance. To that end, UNISOM II would seek to complete, and, and it set itself a whole lot of goals, which in you know, principle are, laud laud are laudable, but whether they are implementable is another matter. It would seek to complete through disarmament and reconciliation the task begun by, UNIT by UNITAF for the restoration of peace and, and stability law and order. The mandate would also empower UNISOM to provide un assistance to the Somali people in rebuilding their shattered economy and social and political life, re-establishing the country's institutional structure, achieving national political reconciliation, recreating a Somali state based on democratic governance, and rehabilitating the country's economy and in infrastructure. <coughs> Laudable aim. The decision by the Security Council to authorize the dispatch of a, of a UN military force to Somalia to, a, to establish a secure environment for humanitarian relief, uh, ensuring that relief supplies had, uh, were able to reach all, po all population centers where there was need. But this was this, but of course, but going into this, the, the fact that Somalia was chosen did not present a problem on the question of 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 internal interference in the affairs of the country. 
because Somalia had no, had no government. There was no government there to say, stop it. Because, as I said, there had been a complete collapse of the state and there was civil disorder. The violence, the inter-clan and inter-faction fighting, and the complete state of anarchy that engulfed the, the capital of the country, Mogadishu, and many provinces of the southern region, prevented humanitarian aid from reaching hundreds of thousands of war and famine victims. The US task force, as envisaged by President Bush, was a necessary and indeed indispensable means of working towards some civil order, of working towards at least getting supplies to the people who needed them. But then it was found on the ground that things were much easier said than done. Access to certain areas required a tranquil environment, and this seemed to be achievable only by the disarming of the warring factions and others, the, se the securing of supply routes and the safeguarding of relief distribution centers. In the political field, and this is interesting, because the UN wa was given a political mandate, the UN role was to assist local leaders in reconciliation while emphasizing that political reconstruction had to be achieved by the Somalis themselves. The Security Council resolution provided for an expanded UN operation which would support national reconciliation. This was done by the rehabilitation of the country's infrastructure, political institutions, the disarmament campaign, an arms embargo. This is really, I think, a bit uh, fanciful because Somalia had all the arms it, it, it could digest. Uh, so an arms embargo was almost like lo uh, locking the stable after the horse had bolted. The reestablishment of a, of, a, of a national police force and to ensure that all Somali parties to agreements honored the commitments they had entered into. Now, the Somali case was unique, and it offered a departure from past UN humanitarian operations. It was the first of its kind. Unlike the case of conflict situations, where UN forces are generally implied as peace observers or peacekeepers on the basis of agreed ceasefires between the parties concerned, in Somalia, the UN presence assumed an enforcement role with a mandate to use all appropriate means necessary to enforce the demands of the Security Council. Of course, that process imposed special responsibilities on the UN force itself. Its members needed to be exceedingly circumspect in their conduct towards the indigenous population and in, the matter, and in the manner in which they discharge their duties. There needed to be a very careful understanding of the customs, culture, and, and social and political sensitivities of the local people. The United Nations had been accused of, of doing too little in the past. As it assumed new responsibilities under the new mandate given to it by the Security Council, it needed to guard against being seen as a politically manipulative or coercive force. Admittedly, the UN was going into uncharted seas with little to guide it, and it was faced with a situation of unprecedented instability. However, it cannot be said that it acquitted itself well in Somalia. I said, this is my view. Even though I've, I've long served the UN, I feel in this particular case, the UN could have done better. It often departed from the principles it had set itself. 
The Secretary General's report of March 1993 stated the following. Notwithstand notwithstanding the compelling necessity for authority to use enforcement measures as appropriate, I continue to hold to my conviction that the political will to achieve security, reconciliation and peace must spring from the Somalis themselves. A very important and a good point. Even if it is, even if it is authorized to resort to resort to forceful action in certain circumstances, UNISOM cannot and must not be expected to substitute itself for the Somali people. Nor can or should it use its authority to impose one or another system of governmental organization. It may and should, however, be in a position to press for the observation of United Nations standards of human rights and justice. However, when in the face of a deteriorating situation, the United Nations and the United States attempted to reevaluate their policies, they still seem to be unable to get beyond an oversimplified rationale. The United Nations presence was pictured simply as a force for peace, determined to carry out its Security Council mandate, but obstructed in its humanitarian and nation-building tasks by the ambitions of one of the country's belligerent faction leaders. The situation was more complex than that, and the UN continued to flounder because it failed to recognize and learn from its mistakes, and above all, to see the picture from a Somali perspective. Many Somalis who originally welcomed the UN presence in their country and hoped to see the elimination of all the so-called warlords came to view the deteriorating situation as a result of misguided policies of the post-famine UN-US operation. A Somali view of the breakdown of the UN mission goes something like this. The United Nations decided to deal with this particular leader in spite of his record and staked a great deal on his initial cooperation in Addis Ababa. It then took umbrage when he tried to organize, quite openly and in the Somali style of clan negotiation, a political agenda independent of the UN-inspired and UN staged Addis Ababa conference. That leader's criticism, of course, his name is General Idid, of UNISOM on the radio station he controlled led to the occupation of the station by Pakistani UN forces, a move forcibly opposed by ID supporters defending what they felt to be their right to free expression and free political organization. Furthermore, UNISOM's hostile preoccupation with ID while remaining on friendly terms with other warlords, created the impression that it was designed to upset the balance of power among the competing factions. Whether or not all the components of this scenario are valid or not, the, the UN, for example, denies that it occupied the radio station, but some foreign journalists have reported otherwise. The fact remains that UNISOM came to be seen as having an insensitive attitude which took no account of the fiercely independent Somali spirit and viewed the complexities of clan politics as either irrelevant or open to foreign manipulation. It is significant that the report of a UN appointed commission of inquiry on the killing that, that killings that took place at the at the at the radio station, commented on uh, co commented on the incident, concluded that the ensuing clash between IZ's forces and the uh, and the Pakistanis peacekeepers was not a peacekeeping, but a peace enforcement operation. The commission further commented, and this is uh, very important, that many of your UNISOM's senior political advisors lacked experience and knowledge of UN peacekeeping practices and were insensitive 
to the local culture's requirements. A question that many Somalis asked themselves at the time was whether the UN cared more about its wounded image than about the uncounted and unpublicized numbers of Somali civilians who were killed in the unsuccessful and often farcical military operations against ID. The peacekeeping force at times showed callous disregard for the safety of the population of Mogadishu. The uncounted and unpublicized deaths of innocent bystanders, including women, children, respected clan elders, and religious leaders, were treated as if these were of no consequence. In one particular tragic military engagement that took place in the alleys and back streets of the capital, the Red Cross estimated Somali casualties on that one occasion to have been between 500 to 700, including many innocent civilians. Yet hardly any mention was made of this terrible loss of life at the time. There must be, in my view, there must be more transparency with regard to casualties, whether those suffered by the population or those suffered by the, by, by the intervening force. There must be more transparency on the part of the inter intervening force in regard to their actions, for they too must be held accountable to the law for any violations of the rights of others, particularly those who they've been sent specifically to protect. If this situation was the face of peacekeeping in the brave new post Cold War world, perhaps the clock needed to be turned back to the time when the classic rule of peacekeeping was take no sides, make no enemies. The Somali perception of the UN's inflexibility, its lack of impartiality, and its disparagement of purely Somali initiatives is particularly strong in the northwest region of the country, now known as Somaliland. In that region, all had not been lost. It is true that it had experienced inter-clan conflicts, but on a smaller scale and not as prolonged and, and intensive as, that, as those that took place in the south. However, to their credit, and this is not given publicity, at all, the clans in that area, left on their own, have succeeded in establishing peace through the slow and patient negotiation carried out in accordance with Somali tradition and Somali norms. First, at the sub-regional level, and subsequently at the national level, through a four-month-long conference at the, at the town called Borma. They recognized and they, or they understood very much the complexities of their own society. They recognized that things had to be put together, but there were no quick fixes. You have to begin by going to the grassroots of society and building up, go to the villages, to the, to the rural centers, to the towns, getting the people talking, talking peace Talk, talking harmony. But you can't have a quick fix by bringing a group of, of self-assumed leaders, put the, lodge them in a, in a hotel in Addis Ababa or in Nairobi, feed them, comfort them, and, and then say, well, in seven days, I, I, I want from you an agreement. It's not, that's completely un-Somali. Somalis take their time. This is why I, I, I'm taking my time talking to you. <laughs> We, 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 we need space in which to talk. And, uh, <coughs> and they succeeded. Four months. They succeeded without any assistance from the UN, or from the US, or from any source. They managed to sell their camels and their sheep and goats, and 300 participants sat down under trees, discussed things, hammered out, ha hammered out their problems, and in four months, they came up with a charter 
which enable them to form a government based on democratic principles, but, and this is important, adjusted or take, or take note of, 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 some, of Somali institutions. This is perhaps one of, our, one of our major problems at the beginning of independence was that one part of us, the southern part, which was then known as Italian Somali land, was a trusteeship territory of the UN. The, the, the northern part where I come from was a, was a British protectorate. Our political institutions for the new independence were shaped by outside experts based upon their experience and, 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 and replicating the, the, the institutions in their own country, ignoring the indigenous institutions of, of, of the Somalis. That is why we, 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 we were a state which eventually dissolved. Uh, the sad part is, and, I, and this is, I want to digress a little bit here, there has been an acknowledgement that, be, that all was not lost in, in Somalia. The southern part was, was where the devastation took place and the killings took place. Where, even though the previous regime tried its best to destroy the indigenous institutions, it didn't, it didn't succeed in all parts, and particularly in the northwest and the northeast. Those institutions were custom, customary law, the Sharia, they are they're all Muslims, the, 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 the role of the elders, all these re remained intact so that when, when Siabari left, Although there, although there was, to some degree, a, a power vacuum, it wasn't as bad in the South. <coughs> and by going back to their roots, reviving their, 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 their institutions and their customs, and being guided by the Sharia and, and, by, the, and by customary law, they have been able to, re to, to recover, to great really deal, uh, their, 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 their society. Uh, it, uh, and all they need now is a helping hand. They're doing things on their own. They have, they have a, 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 a head of state in the north, star, a patent on the United States uh, having an executive president. They have a bicameral parliament, a House of Representatives representing the, the, the political groups, things, as well as a House of Elders representing the, the, the civic and uh, religious and uh, tribal leaders. And together they work. You have an independent uh, Supreme, Supreme Court. We ha they have begun the long and arduous task of nation building, but they've done it in their way to meet their needs at their pace. Well, what they do need is a helping hand to resolve some of the desperate social and economic problems that have been left behind. I represent, I work in New York with a, with a Center of International Health and, and uh, Cooperation. And we have, a, it's a small group, primarily Americans. We have, a, our chairman is Cyrus Vance and uh, Cardinal, Cardinal O'Connor, uh, a, few other, a few other philanthropists. We've looked into this question very closely, and we feel for Somalia, what we, all our actions must be directed towards helping the Somalis to help themselves. No welfare handouts. Give them the means by which they can pull themselves up by their own bootstraps so they, so, 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 so they, take, so they value what they have achieved, what has been done for them. But of course, needs a legion all, 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 all over Somalia, whether in the north or in the south. But where you do have oases of hope, build on them. Don't put all one's egg in the Mogadishu basket and say, until we resolve some uh, Mogadishu, we, we neglect the other parts. 
Because if you don't rush help to the other part, the other parts will sink. Thank you. The question is, how do you draw the line between uh, humanitarian aid and military intervention? Uh, um, military intervention requires the application of, of Chapter 7 of the Charter. Uh, in the past, humanitarian aid has always been, where, where it's been uh, sanctioned by the Security Council, it was under Chapter 6. Once you bring in, once, it, once you have a decision made under Chapter 7, then, then, then the, uh, the implementing agency has the right to use military measures if, if necessary. Now, in, in the case of Somalia, humanitarian aid, uh, military assistance, military intervention was brought about to enable humanitarian supplies to reach people because of the activities of, of, of marauding bands and, and warlords. Uh, but its mandate went beyond that. Its, it beyond, its mandate went beyond humanitarian intervention. It became a political intervention because it wanted to rebuild the country from scratch. I don't know where I'm answering the, your question. I think so. Mr. Ambassador, I must say the, uh, uh, your carefully reasoned argument was an enormous pleasure. Um, and. Uh, but even uh, more enjoyable in the long run, I think, is the, the great wisdom which you've shared with us. It's been a very, very wonderful evening for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.